Let's look at this situation. Some people claim that taking a course on journalism increases the student's interest in buying newspapers. To test this claim, the behavior of a number of students was studied. The number of times the students in a school bought newspapers in December is shown in Table 1. Then, they took a journalism course during the spring semester, and after that, the number of times they bought newspapers in May um, was measured, which is shown in Table 2. Now, the question is this. Based on this study, can we accept the claim that taking the course on average increases the number of newspapers the students in this school buy per month? Now, it's important to notice that in this situation, we have a sample of the buying behavior of a few students, and then we have an intervention which is taking the course, and after that, we have a measurement of their behavior after taking the course. But the, the question that is asked is not about those specific people, because if we want to know the change in the behavior of those specific people, we can look at the average before and after and make a judgment about this specific sample behavior. But the question is not about the sample. The question is asking us, can we accept a claim about the whole population? Can we accept the claim that taking the course on average increases the number of newspapers the students in this uh, school are taking overall? So the question is about this, uh, about that if all of the students in this school would take this course, would it change their behavior? Okay. Let's think about what is the situation. We have a population of the students and we want to know if taking this course creates a change in their behavior. So what we have done is that we have taken a sample from this population and in that sample we have found that a group of people have bought newspapers. One of them have bought 15 newspapers, the other 13, the other 14, and so forth. But then when we took the second sample from that population, the second sample is also framed from the same group of people. And then we looked at the number of times that they were buying newspapers. We found that it is 14 and 16 and 15 newspapers. So this is after the in intervention. This is before, and this is the, this is after intervention which is taking that class. And the problem that we have now is that these two samples are not independent. There are the same number of people, same group of people in these two samples. So the techniques of the analysis of the difference between the two independent samples doesn't work in this case. However, we can think about this question in a different way. We can think of, okay, if this is the population of all of the people's behavior before and after taking this course, each person in this population would have a difference made to his or her behavior. So, If we think about the population of all of the differences, now we can think about the difference that we observe in our sample of people like this. So the difference in the behavior of the first person in our sample is negative 1. And the difference in the behavior of the second person in our sample is 3. So now if this is the population differences, then we have a sample of those differences. And 
now we can think of is this sample difference a enabling us to make a judgment about the difference for the whole population. Okay. Now, let us think about the claims that we are dealing with. This is the population of all of the students in this school. But we are interested in the differences that could be made uh, to the buying behavior of the students in this population. If all of the students in this population would take the course, for some of them, it might create a negative influence. They would buy less newspapers. And for some of them, it might uh, have a different influence. It may increase their uh, uh, the number of newspapers they buy per month. So if this is the population of differences that would be made if all of the people in the population uh, would take this course, we have actually taken a sample of eight of the students which have taken the course, and we have seen a specific behavior in this group. If you look at the numbers, you'll see that we have a reduction in the number of newspapers that the first student bought, and then we had an increase uh, in the number for the second person in the sample, and another increase, and so forth. Some had no differences, some had increase in their uh, buying behavior, and so forth. But what is the claim that we are dealing with? The claim that we are dealing with is that the question says, can you accept that taking the course on average increases the number of newspapers that the students in the whole school buy per month? So if you think about the average difference that taking that course would make for all of the students in this school, the question says, would that average difference be positive? So that is the question. So if that is the, if that is the mean difference in the population, one of the claims says, would that mean difference be positive? It says, would it increase their buying behavior? Now, we think to ourselves, okay, this is one of the hypotheses that is possible about the influence of this course. But the other possibility is that the mean difference that is made by taking this course is that the, the average buying behavior of the population, the average of the differences made to the people in the population would be no change or it's a reduction. So maybe the mean difference made to well, is less than zero. Now we are dealing with two hypotheses. We consider this one as the non-hypothesis and this one as the alternative hypothesis because the one that has equality enables us to make a judgment. So this one we call the null hypothesis. Then we accept the null hypothesis tentatively. And everything that we argue from here on base, is based on that tentative acceptance. So we say, OK, the, the mean difference uh, in the population can be negative or zero. Let's take the the extreme case of this claim, which would be the mean difference is equal to zero, and then see what would be our judgment based on that. If you accept that the mean difference that is made to the population is zero, and we start taking all possible uh, samples of size eight from that population, the first sample, this is sample number one, 
would have an average difference, we call it d1 bar. And then if you take another sample of size 8 from that population, it would have another average difference, that would be d2 bar. And if you take all possible samples, d3 bar and so forth, uh, and we think about the distribution of those average sample differences, they would have a distribution like this. And uh, I want to argue that if we think about the mean of all of the differences, average differences in our samples, would be equal to 0. Because if null is accepted to be right in this specific case that the mean difference is 0, if mean difference is 0, yeah, the first sample difference, this one, can be positive. Next one can be negative, D2. D3 may be uh, positive. But if we look at the average of all of the D bars, if there is no difference in the population itself, then uh, the average of all of the differences should be 0 if you take all possible samples. Now, the other thing that we want to think about is the standard deviation of d bar. And the standard deviation of d bar would be, according to central limit theorem, would be the standard deviation of the population divided by a square root of n. However, the standard deviation of the population we don't know Instead of the standard deviation of the population, we can use the standard deviation of differences in our sample. And divided by a square root of n. However, if you use that standard deviation, we have to use t distribution. Whenever we use the standard deviation of the sample instead of standard deviation of the population, then we have to um, go to t distribution. In this case, the degree of freedom of our t distribution would be n minus 1, which is 8 minus 1. So we are dealing with the t distribution with a degree of freedom of 7. Now, the next thing that we have to think about is that if we accept the null hypothesis, what would be the situations that we can reject it based on our sample? Okay, so let's think about that. The null hypothesis says that the mean difference in the population is either 0 or less than 0. So if I take a sample and I see that the average difference in my sample is negative, I would not be able to reject the null because null already says that the mean difference in the population is negative. But if I take a sample, I see that the average of my sample differences is very much positive in this region, then observation would be against the claim because the null hypothesis claims that the average difference in the population is negative. If I, if I get a very big positive average difference, that would enable me to reject the null. So we have a rejection area on this tail of the distribution of sample average of differences. Now, let's assume that the researchers debating in this scenario accept that if their theory predicts that an event has a chance of less than 5% happening, and then they do, they do an experiment and they see that those kind of things that have very minimal chance of less than 5% happen right away, then the hypothesis they have accepted is false. Okay? If they have such an agreement, it means that the level of significance for them is 0.05%. This means that those things that have a chance of less than 5% happening 
is considered significant based on their theory. If they predict something that has chance of uh, less than 5%, and that thing happens right away, they accept that their theory would be rejected. So this means that we are searching for a critical T, T critical, that beyond that point, the area under the T distribution would be 0 0.005. And we have one tail in uh, this case. So if we go to a row 7 of T distribution and search for one tail 5%, we will see that our T critical is 1.895. 1 1.895 comes from the T distribution table as the value that beyond that we have 5% chance of happening. So now we think about our observation. In this spreadsheet, we can see the result of our experiment. Before, in December, Mary has about 15 newspapers per month, John 13, and so forth. After taking the course, this is the number of newspapers they have bought. So we are interested in actually the differences in the number of newspapers they bought before and after the experiment. So if we look at after minus before, this shows us that we have a difference of negative 1 for the first person, and these are the differences that we observe in our sample. Now, the average of our sample, which I call d bar, is this. Average of our sample. This is the average of the sample. And... Uh, if I look at the standard deviation of the sample, if I choose the standard deviation of the sample, I will see that this is the standard deviation of my sample. So that is the S of sample, and then S divided by square root of n would be this number divided by square root of the size of the sample. And we have eight numbers. So let us add what we found out from our sample to this diagram d bar in our sample is 1, and the standard deviation of our sample is 1.6036. This means that from our sample, we can understand that 1.6 0, 0.036 divided by square root of 8 gives us 0. 0.567. Now, what is the T of our observation? The T of my observation is the difference that I'm observing is 1. The difference that was claimed and I accepted was that the mean difference is 0. This is my acceptance. And the standard deviation of variations is SD divided by a square root of n, which is point five, six, seven. This means that T of our observation is 1.7638.
Now let's think where is the T of observation. Our T of observation is here, somewhere around here. This is the T of my observation. My observation shows me that we have a positive difference, but our, the difference that we are observing, though it is positive, though it is inconsistent with the null hypothesis that says mean difference in the population is negative or equal to zero, maybe no change in the population, but the difference is not big enough for us to enable to reject that. This means that the, big, the difference that we are observing can be the result of sampling variability. It is possible that the difference that is made in the population is equal to zero or negative, uh, but as the result of sampling variability in a small sample of eight people, we have observed a positive difference of one. This means that this, the T of observation at this point is not in the rejection area, and it causes us uh, to fail to reject an all. So our decision is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we cannot make a decision about uh, the alternative hypothesis. So we have to suspend our judgment about uh, the alternative hypothesis. Our judgment. And no, we cannot make that claim.